Okay, good. Good of y'all to be punctual. All those are on board now. Just remember to sign in your e-attendance yeah, before we start. Has anyone bought your textbook or ordered your textbook online already? Has anyone already uh, gone online and ordered your textbook? No one. Or just give me a show of hand if you have. Hey, nobody. One, yeah, okay. Only one. Uh. Okay, teaching. So you have these two weeks. I think by this week, this is already week two. Uh, by this week, you should more or less, um, yeah, you should more or less uh, be settled and make up your mind and decide, yeah, uh, whether you're staying on in this course or you're dropping the course. Uh. So once you've made up your mind, you've decided. Please, you need to confirm, I think. You need to confirm in your registration, I think, to make it official uh, that you're in this course. Okay. And just as a reminder, a quick reminder, important reminder, yeah, those of you who are already on board, please remember your that you have your prerequisite for this course. Okay. What's your prerequisite? For this course, hmm? what's your prerequisite? Mastery yes. English. Pardon? Yes, I'm Mas Mastering English. Mastering English. There's your a pass in the GLT. GLT one zero zero nine. Right. A pass in GLT one zero zero nine. You must have that, right? Uh, otherwise, you will not be able to. You will not be able. You will not be allowed la, to sit for this course, and um, you have to ensure yourself la, that you you have the you have the grade. You pass. You have a passing grade for this paper because in the system, uh, we don't have the uh, what do you call it. We don't have the um a system to strike you off if you don't have GLT1009. So you have to know it yourself. Later on, I will ask you for your grades, yeah? Just to make sure that you you, you really got the message, lah, right? That you must have a pass in GLT1009, yeah? Before taking this course. Because there have been many in, uh, instances in the past, huh, where students halfway through the course after seven weeks, then only suddenly they woke up and realized that, you know, they need to have a pass and they did not have did not do that course so and then they have to drop out so it's basically a waste of your time lah. yeah so hope you, you, we, we don't want that to happen to any one of you okay so make sure you have that and um all right how many only how many nine 16 20, 21 of you there are i think 24 25 in this class have registered uh, I thought I asked you all last week to update your profile picture. I still see all your initials here. I hope you can update because, like I say, it's not likely that we are going to meet anytime soon or even right to the end of the course. Huh? So at least I know who I'm talking to, la. Uh, so I can put a face to all your names here. Uh, please try to update your profile picture, your picture, okay? So every week when we meet, uh, it will be like this, lah. Yeah, we will come into the video room, 
and uh, where I will be doing a share screen with you, some slides uh, on the topic. Yeah, that will take about an hour or so or more, one and a half or more, right? Sharing screen. And then we move on to the chat room, yeah, where we continue uh, communicating uh, via chat so that you won't have to. Um, so there's a change, like change of pace, and you don't have to sit in front of your camera. Uh, but of course, you have to sit in front of your screen throughout. Now, mind you, it's a three hour course. Uh, so I want all of you, as far as possible, to, to participate in the class. Okay? Participate so that you can engage, la, engage yourself with the, with the class, your presentation. Otherwise, it, it's going to help you anyway. It's going to benefit you when you participate, answer questions. Don't worry about your question, your answers being wrong or right or your responses has not been correct. If you have all the while have correct answers, then no point uh, taking this course, isn't it? Right? So participate, be an active participant and engage in the class. Otherwise, how to go through the three hours? Yeah, it also help you to be able to remember and also hopefully to understand uh, right what is being shared here. Okay, is that all right? You unmute and, and anytime when there are questions, uh, stop me and ask or any time when I'm not clear uh, either in terms of connectivity or in terms of my explanation or you can't see my slides, please stop me and let me know. Okay. So right now you can hear me clearly, right? All okay, all good, huh? It's doctor. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. yes doctor. Right, good. Yes. All right. Um, I think I shall start now. Three, five, nine, three, nine, nine, eight. Okay, now almost all of you, not all of you are on yet, but I'm going to start now. All right, I'm going to do my share screen now, yeah? Okay, can you see me? I mean, can you see my screen? Uh, my slides? Yes. Yes. Yes, Dr. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So we are now in week two already. Yeah, we are now in week two. And um, um, what we did last week was just a one hour introduction. Okay. So based on your schedule, this week we are doing what is technical writing. So basically we are covering the definition of technical writing, basically what is technical writing. Lah? And uh, more importantly, the characteristics of technical writing. Yeah, the characteristics of technical writing. So you have to, before you even start lah, the course, you need to know lah, what is technical writing all about? Uh, what does it involve? What does it require you to write? Okay, so can you tell me what is technical writing then? Or what is not technical writing? You've done a lot of writing in your uh, as students in, in school, even in the university, isn't it? So what's the difference between technical writing and the other kinds of writing that you've been doing? Anybody? I think I mentioned that last week. What is not technical writing? Okay, when do you do technical writing? Where do you where are you likely to do technical writing? Hmm? Um, maybe the technical writing uh, usually have a certain format to write and uh -huh. usually it's used in a more formal places. Okay, right, all right, yeah. Basically, uh, format, all kinds of writing also follow a certain format. Lah. So, so does technical writing, yeah. But basically, technical writing is the kind of writing you do at the workplace. That is the difference between the different kinds of writing that you've done in school or as a student. Uh, 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 the writing, the kind of writing that you do at the workplace. Let me show you my slide. Yeah, uh, where technical information is delivered or conveyed in writing. So mind you, there's a lot of writing. A lot of writing needs to be done at the workplace uh, for your information. In case you are not aware of that, or in case you don't realize that, most of you would have thought that. Uh, uh, all the writing that you need to do is when you are a student, right? When you write essays and so on, um, 
and that once you're done with studying, you graduate from your university, from your course, and you go and work at the workplace, that should be the end of writing, isn't it? Why do you need to do writing at the workplace? Right? But that's where you're wrong. At the workplace, a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it, communication is also done via writing. In fact, the skill of communicating, uh, uh, employers uh, hire people who have skills in communication, uh, both verbally, orally, as well as through writing. So the kind of writing you do at the workplace to convey information through writing is called technical writing. And uh, the, the outcome of technical writing, the most important outcome of technical writing is so that when people read your information, they're able to do something. It is people read technical documents to do something, to, 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 to um, complete, a, 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 what do you call it, um, a job, right? Or to solve a problem. Okay, so technical writing basically is not creative writing. Yeah, it is not even uh, journalism. It's not. It's not about reporting, uh, reporting about certain news or certain event. It is not. It certainly is not creative writing. It's not about uh, writing poems and so on. Right, and it's also not personal writing. It's not the kind of writing you write and share about your personal experiences. That's not technical writing. Yeah. Technical writing is basically writing that conveys technical information to readers who want the information to carry out something, right? To do a job, to, to complete, let's say, for example, you, you uh, uh, to read a, a guide or manual to install something. So that guide is an example of a technical uh, document, uh, right? It's the kind of technical writing that you, you, you will be, you, you need to do at the workplace, okay? So for your information, uh, 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 studies have shown uh, that an employee in the workplace will spend at least 20% of their time writing. At least 20%. And um, so what kind of writing is done at the workplace? Do you write essays in your, in your workplace? Do you write essays? Memos. Yeah, not essays. Huh? Not the kind of essays that you do. You write things like memos letters, right? emails, reports. This is, uh, these are examples of technical writing. This is the kind of writing you do at the workplace. And in fact, the higher up the corporate ladder you go, when you become a manager, you spend at least 50% of your time writing. And uh, like I said, communication, uh, both through writing and through verbal, uh, oral communication is very important in the workplace. Yeah. And if you're a CEO, right, you spend, you spend 80 to 100% of your time communicating, either uh, through verb, through, through orally as well as through writing. So it is important. Okay. And um, in fact, technical writing, the skills of technical writing can be acquired through practice as compared to, let's say, creative writing. Not everybody can do creative writing because creative writing, you do need a certain a kind of inborn talent, inborn creative skills, isn't it? To be able to write creatively. But technical writing, the good news is anyone can be an effective technical writer through practice. So you can pick up the skill, right? It can be acquired, right? So uh, that's what we are here to learn. Uh, yeah? So, uh, right, let's look at one example uh, of a technical document. Uh, okay, can you see this? Right? This is an example of technical writing. Yeah? Just take a quick look at it and some just uh, tell me what is what are the features here that makes it different uh, from the normal essays that you've learned to write in school or in your previous courses. How is this technical writing different from essay writing? Can you tell me? That normally you, you don't you don't it doesn't appear in essay writing. What is it that makes it characteristic of text? Sections. Sorry, sections. Yeah, like what kind of section? As you can see, it is divided up into. Uh, this is called the main heading or the main title, right? And then you have subheadings, isn't it? Subheadings. Yeah. So you don't have that, isn't it, in essay writing? 
maybe you have an essay, yeah, a title, but you don't have subheadings. So in technical writing, you have features like subheadings, headings written in bold. What else do you notice here? That makes it different from essays and uh, even to other forms of writing that you've been used to. What else do you notice? Mm, it comes with the numbering. Ah, the numbering. Can you see the list here? It's called a list. La. It's, it is, uh, the information is presented in the form of a list, numbered list. The list can be a numbered list, can be a bulleted list, all right? It's under this heading called instructions. And as, especially, and, and anyway, you can, by the look of this, it should, it's something like a manual, isn't it, right? In fact, this is actually a guide, a guide, a very simple basic guide explaining how to grow a plant cutting. So that's why this numbered list is very useful, very helpful, isn't it, to the reader? Because it shows you step by step, isn't it, what needs to be done. Okay? So the re a reader who reads this will know at the end of reading, after reading it, this, then the reader will be able to do something, carry out an action. What is he able to do after reading this? Hopefully, like, if the writing is effective, if the steps are, are, are well written and explained, then the reader who reads this will be able to Accomplish something. Do what? What? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, to grow a plant cutting. Basically, this is what this is the purpose la, of the writer who write this, right? Giving uh, information on how to grow a plant cutting. Okay. So in um in, in technical writing, which brings us to the point that Technical writing basically, or that technical document, uh, has three basic, uh, uh, what do you call it, basic um, aspects that you have to look at. First of all, technical document needs to convey a specific piece of information, right? And then uh, the information must be specific. In this case, what is the information that is, uh, the specific information that is conveyed here? Information, uh, steps or instructions on how to grow plant cuttings, okay? Um, and not only that, they convey a specific information to a specific or to specific readers. Does any what uh, does anybody or everybody will be interested? Will anyone be interested in reading this? Or will, are, are you and I interested in reading this document? Unless you'll be interested if you you would want to read this if you want to grow. Yeah, exactly. If you are interested, if you want to learn yeah, how to grow a plant cutting, then you will be reading this. If you are not interested in plant cuttings or growing or gardening, you won't be reading this. So technical documents are written to specific readers, targeted readers, okay, who wants to have the information so that it result in an outcome and action. The reader will be able to do something as a result of reading this. Yeah. And uh, okay, so it must have a specific information uh, given to directed at specific uh, targeting specific readers for and, and thirdly for a specific purpose. As a writer, you must know what is your purpose of writing this document. You must be clear on this three. Your subject, that is the specific information. Your, uh, in this case, is instructions on how to grow plan, cutting. And you must also know your audience, right? That is. Audience means readers, like in this case, right? you'll be using the term audience throughout. It means the readers of the technical document. And as a writer, you must know why you are writing. This is the what, this is the who you're writing to, this is the what you're writing, who you're writing to. In this case, who will be somebody who's interested like, in growing a plant cutting. And you must know your specific purpose for writing. Why are you writing this? So the purpose it answers the question why. In this case, what is the purpose of the writer coming up with this document? What is his purpose? To? To persuade more people to grow a plant cutting. Can, yeah, it's to persuade. But in this case, it is it is not, if you say to persuade, it's more like he will be giving the pros and cons and so on, isn't it, of growing plants out of plant cutting. But basically, he's just giving instructions on how to grow. So in this case, it is just to, instead of, um, not so much as persuading. I suppose the people who pick this up and read 
are already interested in this activity. So it is more of, see the bulk of it? Instructions, isn't it? So to? Give me a guideline to them. Ah, guidelines, instruct, to explain, to inform. Yeah, uh, to explain, inform, to instruct on how to grow plant. Okay, so uh, uh, so uh, you just keep that in mind. A uh, 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 technical document should be clear in these three aspects. Uh, what the information is about, it must be a specific information, who you are writing to, and why you are writing. Okay, let's look at another document. Okay, can you see this? Right? Yes. Another, this is another example of a technical document. Again, what do you see here? Tell me what you uh, what do you notice? What are the thing that strikes you in this uh, this particular piece of uh, document or uh, technical writing? What strikes you? That makes it different from the other kinds of writing that you're used to, right? It is attached with image. Yeah, there's image, pictures. You call it graphics, right? Just like earlier on also, uh, there was an image, a picture there. Now, basically, the just now this one. Now, you see there's a picture. Now, a picture is basically or, or, or image, right? Graphics, you call it. It's not so much to decorate the page, right? But it is to cl further clarify to, so that to ensure that your reader is clear about the information you're giving. So, you give graphics to help to the reader to understand better what you're saying. This is not so much, but this one is very good. Right, it's a picture. You have pictures and graphics to show the reader, right, so that they are very clear about what this document is about. What is this picture about? Uh? Do you, uh, do you, are you familiar with this? It's a picture of what? The heart. The heart, yes. It's like in biology, right? The atrium, the mitral valve, the left ventricle. This is about the heart. In fact, um. This is also a, a close close up. If you can make out the words, huh? right? And it is uh, the title is prolapsed valve, the valve of the heart. So this uh, this uh, what do you call it document um, is about is about the uh, the heart, but what aspect of the heart? So in which brings us, us to the specific subject. What is the subject of this uh, article? The specific information. What is it about? Subject means and also it also means the topic lah, the, the focus la of this document. What is it about? Mitral valve prolapse. Yes. Very clear, very easily to find out what the subject's about. It usually is or usually is already shown in the uh, title. See? Mitral valve prolapse. What you should know. So it's actually a condition of the heart, yeah, condition of the heart, and uh, it's it's very clear. And you, as technical writers, uh, like what I've always said, um, um, your subject must be very clear. Your your topic must be very clear. Don't let the reader guess what you're trying to say. Yeah? Uh, don't keep them in suspense. Uh? Uh, your your job here is not to um, you're not writing a mystery novel. Yeah, you're writing you're writing to give information, to give instructions, right? To, to give explanations. So you must always be clear and forthright and uh, straightforward, right? In the words you use, right? In your explanation. Um, so usually the title alone will already tell the reader uh, what your topic is about, what your subject about. So this is actually a microbial prolapse, uh, right? It's a condition of the heart. And if you look at how this writer uh, provide the information, what else do you notice about this document besides the pictures? Besides the pictures, what else do you notice? What what kind of uh, organizing? Um, uh, how does uh, the writer present his information in such a way that uh, helps the reader to read uh, clearly with understanding? What oh, is the information written? Can you see? The writer put the question. Uh, the writer what? Put the questions. Ah, ask questions, is it? Presented questions. Very good. Yes. You see, the writer provides his uh, presents his information first in short paragraphs. Can you see in short paragraphs? And then on each paragraph explains a certain aspect of this topic. And this as and this is uh, written under subheadings. And the subheadings is in the form of questions. It's very interesting. He writes it in the form of question. What is my prolapse? 
And then he comes with a short paragraph to explain what it is. Atrova prolapse is a condition in which the two work, blah, blah, blah. And then the next subheading, what happens during MVP? Yeah, this is a, a technique that he uses. He uses question to form his subheadings, but uh, it's actually to target at a certain uh, ex, um, area that he wants to address. Now, this, this paragraph will explain what happens uh, when a person has my, vitro, uh, mitral valve prolapse. And then, is mitral valve prolapse dangerous? And then a short explanation. In most cases, it is harmless, blah, 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 and so on. Huh? And then, what causes MVP? Okay. As you can see, uh, it's, um, he's arranged his information, right? Uh, very clearly, right? Very straightforward. And if you're a reader who wants to find out more about mitral valve prolapse, you find that it's quite readable, isn't it? It's quite easy to get the information. In fact, it's actually the information is quite basic. It's very basic, right? About this condition. Okay? So this is what he used. Subheading, short paragraphs. And also his subheadings are in bold form. Yeah, so as you can see, it's very different from a normal essay writing. Yeah, five paragraph essay writing is very different. So that is technical writing. Who do you think uh, is the specific audience for this document? Who is the specific audience? Who is he writing to? Anyone and everyone? Will you and me be interested in reading this? We won't. Won't be interested. Yeah. Okay. Who do you think will maybe. be interested in reading this? A medical student, maybe. Medical students? Okay, right, because it's a medical condition, isn't it? Could be medical students. Who else? Who else? How about patients? Yeah, very good. Patients. People with this condition, probably. Or maybe a friend uh, of somebody who has this condition or relative or family of a patient who has this condition, right or not, then you'll be interested to read. Okay? So it is written to a specific audience who wants to find out more information regarding this condition. Just now, uh, okay, between medical student and a patient, uh, uh, do you think this article, this uh, article, yeah, you call it an article, is targeted more at, a, at medical students or at, at the patient? Do you think which one? Do you think it's written specifically for medical students to find out more about this condition, or is it to patients? Mm, to patient, maybe. Mm. Why not medical student? Uh, because if for medical student, I think the the description should will be more than more than that. Yes. Like, this one is I more like a briefy. Yeah, precisely. Because as you can see, yeah, uh, if you can if you, if you can get to read some of this, actually the explanation is all very basic. Uh, the explanation, the the, 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 the the information given is quite basic and uh, it is more and then the, and then there's no like medical jargon or terms being used, right? That may be confusing uh, to people. Uh, that uh, that medical students are used to, but may not be uh, familiar. Uh, normal people may not be familiar with, so they don't use medical jargon and use very simple words and very simple explanation. So this article, you are right, is more targeted at outside people, people outside the medical field, but who are interested in reading because, like we what we say, he could be a, be a patient who has this condition, or you know of someone who has this condition and you want to read up about it. But not so much to medical students. Not in this case, because medical students will need more than this information, more details would be required, isn't it? Right. For example, they would read up their medical textbook. You won't find this in the medical textbook because it's too general, uh, too general and not detailed enough. So it is more for uh, people who are outside the medical field, who wants to find out because they uh, have something to do with this condition, yeah. So this one, it also in in this case it shows to you very clearly, which you want, I want you to remember because later on we'll come to audience again. That knowing who your audience is, uh, is very important as a technical writer. 
when you write a technical document, you must know who your audience is, who you are writing to. You cannot write the same document to medical student and to the patient and give them the same document. No, because different types of audience have different levels of knowledge and understanding. So the information, so you have to decide uh, how much information to give or how little to give or how much detail or how to organize your content okay, so that it will fit the audience that you are targeting. So that if, if you write too much information and too detailed in this case, uh, outside people who read it, right? A patient who read it will get confused, isn't it? They won't understand if you give them too much of information or too detailed. But to a medical student, it's fine, right? So knowing who your audience is is very important because it will determine how you write, what technique to use. Okay, so keep that in mind. Huh? So uh, audience will be like what you have mentioned, someone who needs information, right? So it is not to medical students or to another medical doctor, not even to a staff nurse, but possibly uh, not to anyone in the medical field, uh, but people outside the medical field. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. What do you think is the purpose? Why do you think the writer writes this? What purpose does he hope to achieve when he writes this for people who have the condition and who wants to know more about this? This condition. What is his purpose in this case? Is it to propose something, to recommend something, or to provide information? Uh, to inform. Yeah. To, to give information about uh, the important information on the condition. On the condition. That's right. To inform. That's right. This is called to inform lah. So that what kind of outcome uh, would the writer expect? So that when the when the when the audience read this, the person who reads this, he has the information, and he will and that and this information will help him to decide lah, to make a decision or to decide on what to do next, to go for treatment ga, to to go for surgery or whatever lah, right? Of course, he will need to see his doctor further on all that lah. This is just a general information. So basically, it's to inform, so that he can make decision on what to do next. So remember, technical documents ah. You write with the purpose of after the reader read your document, he must take he must know what action to take, what to do, or how to. In this case, for example, uh, like just now the plant cutting, how to grow a plant cutting, to do something, uh, to do an action as a result of reading your receiving your information. Okay, so the purpose is to provide practical information, so enable the reader to take action uh, or to make a decision on what to do next, and so on. Okay, all right. Any questions so far? Are you okay? So that is, was just the uh, examples of two that technical documents la, that we've shown you. Now we're going to something more. Um, uh, the bulk of this uh, today's class will be on characteristics, which we have already talked about just now. The characteristics of technical writing, right? And uh, which make which uh, make technical writing different from other forms of writing, such as essay writing and so on. Yeah. So how does technical writing differ from other forms of writing through this uh, character, uh, six characteristics? Okay, so we'll cover this very quickly. Just now we have already mentioned some of it. One of it, the first one is subject. Okay, the subject is very specific in technical writing, like what we have said just now. Very sub a subject actually means the topic, la, the focus, la, right? Just now was plant cutting. This one is on the heart condition, right? So the topic, the focus, right? Of the of the technical document is very specific, right? Very specific, and more importantly, the topic or the subject or the information presented must be accurate, based on facts. So all this information must be correct information. As a technical writer, please be, uh, be aware of that. That what information you give uh, in your technical document must be accurate. You cannot afford to have mistakes or errors in the information that you give. And it must be based on facts, not on personal opinions, right? Not on how you feel. Huh? You are not writing about personal experiences. You are writing, giving information based on facts to your readers. Okay? So be very careful on that because mistakes and errors in the information uh, given in technical document can lead to very serious consequences, you know. Yeah. Uh, for example, let's say if the errors you've given, I mean, if there are some errors or, or mistakes in the information given, the patient who reads it may make a wrong decision. 
right? Or let's say in 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 in, in a manual, all right, that that uh, for installing electrical equipment, let's say, and you have written the manual and there are errors in it. What what will happen? What happens when the reader reads it and follow your instructions and there are mistakes there? Can lead to grave consequences, isn't it? Right? The person can get injured. Uh, let's say installing something like electrical equipment, uh, equipment may get spoiled or worse. Uh, it may even cause death, right? And then you get sued, the company gets sued, and all kinds of things. Lah. Create bad image for the company, for the employee. So you're writing technical, as a technical writer, please, you must be very clear that the information you give must always be accurate, right? Objective based on facts. Okay? So we go on quickly to the next one, like we mentioned just now, audience. So uh, as a very, uh, just now we have already shown, right? Uh, you must know your audience as a technical writer. Knowing who your audience is will help you determine, to determine how to write, okay? What techniques to use. So basically, a skillful technical writer will recognize, will must learn to recognize their audience. And basically, there are three categories of audience. We shall look at this uh, Three categories, yeah. The first one we call it um, high tech peers. Peers are people who work with you in your company, la, right? And uh, the, the the people that you write to may somebody in your company, but uh, they are under this category called high tech peers. That means basically what it means is the person reading your document is of the same level as you, has the same level of technical not of knowledge or expertise in the subject matter that you are discussing, right? Maybe same job title even, same education, same years of experience. So their understanding of the subject matter is equivalent, same level as yours. Okay, that's high tech peers. For example, a doctor writing to a doctor. Okay. The other category, the second category of audience uh, that you have to consider is when you're writing to low tech peers. Peers, as, as you can see, is a person working in the same company as you, but they are considered low tech, which means basically it means that they do not have the same uh, level of understanding in the subject matter that you are writing. They could, they not, maybe not same job title, not same education, right? Uh, not same years of experience. So they will not have the same level of understanding uh, in the subject matter as you. So you have to adopt a different style of writing, different approach in writing, in giving, uh, in writing your information. Okay, for example, a doctor writing to a staff nurse, or maybe a doctor writing to uh, somebody in the, uh, who is not in the medical line, that's an accountant, or even though a professional, but it's not in accounting, in the medical field. So it considered a low tech peer. So your approach to writing the information that you give, right, will be different as when a doctor writes to a doctor. Okay. And the third group, of course, is called the lay readers. Lay readers are people like a doctor writing the patient to the patient. Patient is totally out of the medical field in this case. Totally have very little minimum understanding of the, uh, of the subject matter that you are talking about. So you need to write in a different approach. Okay. So different knowing your audience, whether your audience is in which category is very important. It determines, it helps you to decide on how much information to give, how details should you go, too detailed for somebody who is who doesn't need so much detail, he will get confused. If your detail is too little to somebody who knows much more, it, then your writing is of no purpose, serve no purpose, it's not helpful to them. Okay, so you have to decide. Yeah, so that's why it says the writing to different audience requires different techniques. Okay, remember uh, to be effective technical writer, uh, your readers who read your document. Now, remember, people don't read technical documents for pleasure, uh, to be entertained, right? We read technical documents for what? Why do people read technical documents? To get? To get what? To get information. Ah, to get information, to be informed that they can do something, carry out something. Uh, it's not to be entertained, not to be amused, it's not... This is not, like I say, not creative writing. You're not writing short stories or poems, right? It is to get information, to carry out something, to do something. So your so when whatever you write, your reader must be able to understand what you say, understand your information. Okay? So uh, that's why it needs different techniques. Huh? So based, 
basically who the audience is determines what you say and how you say it. So this is uh, let's look at this is one example, a very simple example. Okay, you have three groups of audience: high tech peers, low tech peers, and lay readers. So the style suggested here, this is one example, uh, one style you can use when you're writing to high tech peers is you can use abbreviations and acronyms. Okay, can. For example, uh, if an engineer writes to another engineer, please review the enclosed OP and EN. These are the acronyms and abbreviations. Please review the enclosed OP and EN. One engineer writing to another engineer. Is it clear to the other engineer, you think? And you think that the, 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 the person reading it will be able to understand? Should be lah. Yes. Yeah, should be. Yeah. There's no need for the explanations because they are both high tech peers, right? Same level, both are engineers. So it's, it's acceptable to, to, to use abbreviations and acronyms. However, when you write to a low tech peer, abbreviation and acronyms need parenthetical definitions. So you must have definition. For example, an engineer, right, writing the same message to a person who is not in the same field, maybe to somebody in the HR department, okay, or in the accounting uh, department, okay. So you cannot write like this, lah. Okay, what you need is you need to add definitions to these acronyms. So it'd be something like this. Please review the enclosed OP, which is operating procedure, and EN, engineering notice. You see, so you need to give the definitions in brackets if you're writing to a low tech peer. Yeah. Otherwise, if you just send this uh, to somebody who is not an engineer, uh, probably they will not be able. They may think the initials stand for something else. Okay. So that's why you need to have the definitions. And if you're writing to lay readers, that means totally people out of the field, right, who has no uh, uh, very little understanding of the subject matter. Uh, do not use abbreviations and acronyms. It will cause confusion. They may be familiar to you, but it, may not, it will not be familiar to a lay reader, uh, ordinary people outside your field. So you have to give explanations instead. right? So you cannot give a message like this or even this. They won't even know what is operating procedure or engineering notice. Okay? So uh, a better, uh, 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 what do you call it? A better way of writing will be a bit clearer way of writing will be this now. By following the enclosed operating procedure, you can ensure that your printer will run uh, according to our engineer's desired performance levels. This is a full explanation needed if you're writing to a lay reader. They're talking about the same thing, you know, same thing. But if you're writing to a high tech peer, this is already enough sufficient. They can understand. If you're writing to a low-tech peer, if, uh, also they can understand with definition. But if you're writing to a lay reader, uh, you have to give full explanation like this. So this is what you mean by different levels of audience will require different techniques of writing. Yeah, this is just a very simple example. Okay, okay. So we have covered subject and uh, what do you call it? Audience. So this is a third characteristic, organization. How is this document organized? As you can see, uh, if you can look at it, it's very, it's very, uh, how do you like the organization here? Is it clear? Is it readable? Is the information clearly, uh, clearly, clearly presented? As a reader, even as a lay reader, can you get the information quickly and easily? Is it confusing? What do you think? Yes, we can get it clearly. Yes, organization is good here because it's used things like subheading, short paragraphs, and so on, and a lot of white space. Can you see a lot of white space? Uh, uh, pay attention to all these things, uh, because this is uh, organization refers to page layout. The layout, uh, the layout here is clear. Layout means the way the text looks on the page. Okay, layout, and the structure is direct, linear, direct, and uh, it leads from one point to another. Okay, very straightforward, direct, and uh, and uh, layout is clear. Okay, uh, one of the things is, as you can see, the paragraphs are short, right? Not long paragraphs. Some creative, some essays are have long paragraphs. Uh, keep away from all these long 
paragraph long-winded writing uh, in technical document. Uh, short paragraphs uh, give the information straight and direct using simple words. Uh, short paragraphs and uh, also like what I mentioned earlier, he has used subheadings in the form of questions. So all this helps to draw the attention of the reader. And in fact, it's, it's written in such a way with subheadings very clear so that when the reader wants to read, uh, let's say he wants to know, is it dangerous or not? Is this condition dangerous or not? He doesn't need to start from the beginning to read and then to find out up to here to find, find out whether it's dangerous. Straight away, he can zero in in this section under the subtitle, is it dangerous? And then to find the answer to my question. Yeah, so uh, very clear subheadings. Uh, and so on. So the main purpose is so that the reader can get their information quickly la, uh, to access, enable readers to access information quickly. That's the organization. Yeah. Unlike writing essays, sometimes in, in essays you have to read from the beginning, the introduction, then you read the body, then you need the conclusion, isn't it? Yeah. So in this uh, in this uh, technical writing, right, so, yeah, you, uh, it's uh, very the, the, the information is given in clear subheadings. So you can go straight to the point where you want to find out right, the information. Okay, let's look at one example of an organization. Huh? Uh, look at this article. How do you like the organization here? Are you reading? It's not organized. Not organized. Yeah. How is it not organized? Well, How would you describe this layout? Very cool, okay. right? Yeah. Hardly any and any any white space, right? And this is what you call a uh, wall to wall word. Uh, this is very poor organization, very poor layout. Anyone who reads this, uh, you know, it will take a few rounds of reading before you can get uh, the information, isn't it? Very confusing. Although the information is correct, I mean, it's, it's, it's written accurately, but it's the way that it's organized and presented, very poor, right? Because of poor organization, okay? So uh, that's it's an example to show that a poor organization, you will, you will not be effective uh, in writing, in, in reaching to your reader. Uh, so your reader will not be able to understand. So most readers will read halfway and give up, uh, right? Although he want, he needs to get the information, but it will be it's very confusing because of poor organization. All right. So how do you improve on this? What can you do? You tell me. How do you help the reader, uh, the writer, to improve on this so that he can present this information more clearly? What can he do? Maybe use a table. Very good. Yes. You can use graphics. In this case, if you go through the information, you can see uh, it would a table would be would be very uh, 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 what do you call it? it will be very clear. Will make the information very clear. And this is where we come to the next characteristic special features. Now, in 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 this uh, what do you call technical writing special features or they are called highlighting features uh, are used very uh, frequently to help to uh, enable the reader to read more clearly, quickly, and easily. Now, special features such as table, like you mentioned, table. Besides table, what other special features do we uh, technical writers use? Just now we mentioned subheadings, isn't it? Subheadings. What else? Pictures. Yeah. What else besides table, pictures? Those are graphics. What other graphics can you use in uh, uh, technical writing? Now remember, uh, you use this kind of graphics and all. Uh, it is not to, like I said, not for purpose of decoration to decorate your page or make it more attractive. Huh? The main purpose is so that to do what? Present your information more clearly, uh, more clearly, so that your 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 reader can access the information clearly and not get confused. Uh, do not annoy or irritate your reader. Uh, if they, are, if they find their, your presentation is so confusing and they can't understand, can't follow what you're saying. Okay, so special features will help your information to stand out, such as heading, subheading, bold face, column, bulleted list. I remember the list using list, using graphics. Uh, the table is under the category called graphic. Uh, graphic include tables. Remember graphs, right? Pictures, diagrams, charts, 
pie charts, line graphs, bar graphs. Uh, these are the kind of graphics that are normally uh, used in technical writing, technical documents, okay, to, so that your information can stand out more clearly, right, and your readers can access your information. So just now, like we mentioned here, isn't it, right? So this is poor organization. Organization is linked to special features. Right? So to improve this organization, you use a table. You see? The same thing, exactly the same information, but now it's presented in the form of a table. Isn't it much clearer? See the difference? Right? When you use the right graphic to present the facts and information, not in the form of sentences and paragraphs. Okay. Okay. So there is special features, huh, which are used widely uh, in uh, technical writing, right? Wherever it's relevant and uh, helpful, huh, useful huh, to your readers. Okay. So we have covered so far already the four characteristics. What are the characteristics again? Before we go on to the fifth one. What are the characteristics of technical writing that make it uh, that help it, that make it different from other forms of writing? Number one, we look at the subject. Oh, the subject, yes, the subject must be accurate based on facts, specific. Right? Secondly, we looked at the second characteristic: is audience. The audience, knowing who your audience is, uh, will determine how you write. The third characteristic is the is. Organization. organization, right? The organization and making use of the fourth characteristic special features, right? So that your information stand out and your technical document is clear and easily read. So now we cover the last two characteristic style. Number five is style, and number six is tone. Now, this one here we come to the writing part. So far, we have not talked about writing. Huh? We talk about presentation, we talk about organization, we talk about audience, we talk about subject, and so on. So now we come up, we come to this section called the style. Style means it's the actual writing of the document. What kind of style, uh, what style of writing do you uh, do you use, right? In technical, in writing technical documents. You look at the the, the, the example here. Now style refers to the words. The choice of words you use in your explanation. It also refers to your sentence structure. Is it long, complex sentences or simple sentences? It also refers to your paragraph, paragraph length. Okay, so what do you think of the style here? What do you think of the words that are used here? Or what kind of simple. words? Simple. Correct. Use as far as possible. Simple, common words to explain your subject matter. Yeah, because you, as I said, you want your readers to understand what you're saying. Now, doing writing technical documents is not uh, a time for you to use um, big words. Um, somebody say bombastic language. It's not the time for you to show off your uh, how good your English is or how vast is your range of vocabulary. That is for creative writing and other forms of writing, not technical writing. Technical writing, you stick to simple words, simple, straightforward sentences, right? Direct and straightforward. That is the style that you should use, right? In technical writing. Now, you would think that it's, it's, uh, you think that it's much easier, isn't it, writing technical document than, than creative writing, but actually, to write in sim using simple, straightforward uh, style is can be tricky as well. So anyway, we shall learn on that, and it's a, it's a, it's a skill that you can acquire through practice. Huh? Okay, so uh, the key word for style is um, be precise and concise. Okay, what do you mean by precise? What do you mean by concise? That is the style that you should use in your technical writing. What do you mean by precise? Anybody? Precise means what? What do you understand by precise? Accurate. Accurate. Yeah. Or, or uh, exact. Give exact. information that is uh, exact or that is specific. Give specific information. Don't give vague information or 
that people have to guess at what you're trying to say, exact information. So in your style of writing, you must be precise. And and what do you mean by concise? Concise. Short and direct. Direct, short. Use as, in other words, give your information in as few words. If you can use fewer words rather than more words, cut out the extra words and give your information in in uh, a few words. It is more effective than writing long sentences with big words, right? So concise, keep your sentences short, direct, and give your information uh, accurate and exact. Don't be vague, don't have people, don't let your reader try to guess what you're trying to say, right? And here in a few words, uh, don't try to impress your readers uh, with your range of vocabulary and so on. Now, this is not the time to, to, to impress them. This is time to, it's no point if you're writing beautiful language, beautiful, big, bombastic words, but at the end of the day, they don't understand what you're saying. Yeah. So important is, uh, like I say, in technical writing, it's all about the reader. It's not about the writer. Huh? It's all about the reader. If the reader cannot understand what you write, then you have failed as a technical writer. It is not the reader's responsibility to understand what you write, you know. It is the writer's responsibility to make sure that your, your reader understand what you write. Okay, and to do this, to make sure your style is precise and concise. Get it? Okay, so what? Uh, let's look at some. Let's look at some example of precise first. Huh? Examples of. Uh, okay, look at this memo. What do you think? The day. To Michelle Fields from Earl Edding, subject meeting. Please plan to prepare a presentation on sales. Make sure the information is very detailed. Thanks. What do you think of this memo? This is probably written by her boss to Michelle from her boss. Her boss is asking her to do this. What do you think of this memo? What do you think of this time? Do you have questions already popping in your head if you are Michelle and if you receive this memo from your boss? Or do you know exactly what to do? Any questions? Yeah, we can know exactly what we need to do is prepare a presentation. Yeah. The, the subject is quite different with the context. Huh? The subject is quite different from the context. Uh, basically, what you mean is, uh, I think, as uh, to be able to do this, carry this out, prepare a presentation, you need to know more things, isn't it? It says presentation on sales. It's not very clear. Is it precise? Uh? Are there any details that are left out that, that he should have added here so that she will know exactly what to do? If you are Michelle, do you know exactly what to do? What kind of presentation? What sales? No. No, exactly. And even this one, make, your, make sure the information is very detailed. What do you mean by very detailed? If you are Michelle, would you understand? So this is an example of information or style of writing that is not precise, very vague, vague uh, or ambiguous. Ambiguous means that uh, it has, um, it is not uh, clear in its, uh, uh, the meaning is not clear. It can mean different things to different people. If five people were to read this memo, uh, five people will come up with five interpretation of five understanding, isn't it? So this is not clear, it's not precise. So what are the things, what are the details? I mean, it lack details. Uh, not precise means it doesn't have enough details, right? In the in the information that is given here. So what are the how how do you uh, what are the questions that you need to know before you can you can prepare this presentation? What are the questions that will pop up in your head? Normally what do you think? What, do, what else do you need to know? For example? What information is needed? Yeah, what kind of information? I, I it mentioned here sales, but what aspect, okay? What kind? And then, uh, please plan to prepare a presentation on sales. Does it say when? It doesn't say when, isn't it? When does she need to present it? And so on. Now, so the details. So in order to be more pre to be precise, you, you use this guide, the reporter's questions. Ask yourself the reporter's question. Are you familiar with the reporter's questions? 5W1H. The 5W1H questions. 
to make it uh, to, to 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 make sure that the 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 what they call it the information given here is precise. What are the five W and one H questions? Do you know that? The hey, you all don't know what is five W one H ah? The who? Ah, the who? who the which? What? What? Yes. Why? Why? How? Yes. How? How is the H lah? Why? Who? Who are they? Who is she supposed to present to? What? What is she supposed to present on? Not just sales alone. Sales? What? Is it sales report? Is it sales figures? Is it sales techniques? Right? Is it sales performance? What is it on sales? Eh? The what? The why? Why? When? When? Where? These are five W's. Huh? Who, what, when, why, who, what, when, why, and where. And then how. How is it should be presented? All this is not given. So it is a very vague and ambiguous memo. So to improve on it, this, uh, look at this example. Right? The same memo. Look at the information that's given. Please make a presentation on sales techniques. Can you see that? It's a presentation on sales techniques. So not sales report, not sales performance. Okay. So it answers the question, what lah? Yeah. To our sales staff. Can you see? So it shows that or your, she needs to present this to the sales staff, not to the, not to the clients, not to the sales, mani uh, sales uh, manager or what, but to sales staff. This meet, so it answers the question, who? This meeting is planned for, see the date, it's written, date, time, so you answer the question. When? Where should it be presented? Conference room C, so he answers the question. Where? And then here he further explained, our quarterly sales are down. Thus, we need to help our staff accomplish the following. So our quarterly sales are down. In fact, this one will answer the question, why isn't it? Why does she need to make this presentation? Because their sales are down, so they need to help the staff. Okay, and uh, this is the why. Uh, and then the, uh, in the presentation, we should cover these areas, uh, how to make new contacts, how to close deals more effectively, how to earn a 40% profit margin. So this is the what again, uh, what should your presentation cover? What areas, what points should she present uh, to give to the sales staff? And then so further on, use our new multimedia presentation system to make a presentation. So it just explain how she can, isn't it? Answer the question, how uh, by using, you can present it using our new multimedia system. So now this one is what we call an example of precise, clear, and specific writing. The details, in other words, uh, do not leave out the details. Okay. Uh, okay. Now you tell me. Uh, let's do a very quick, quick exercise here. These are examples of uh, sentences, and you tell me whether it's precise or not. The company lost a substantial amount of business. What do you think of this statement? Is it precise? No, we don't know which company no. is that. Yeah, we don't know which. Huh? Which company and what business? Uh, we don't know which company. Okay, maybe I don't say the company. I say our company. La. Our company lost a substantial amount of business. Substantial should, yeah. uh, should give uh, numbers, maybe. Yes, exactly. This word substantial right, is a problematic word. Words like substantial or a lot or very, they are very vague, not clear, not precise, very ambiguous. Because substantial amount, we lost a substantial amount of business, can mean different things to different people. One person may think that, oh, maybe you lost one million ringgit uh, amount of business. That's substantial. Another person will read it and think, oh, maybe we lost 12 clients. Okay, it can mean different things to different people. So to be precise means that in your statement, it must mean the same thing to everyone. So to rewrite this, to improve this on this and to make it precise, you can put in a figure, put in a number, right? put in some details that will help the uh, enable the reader to all, if 10 readers were to read it, they will have the same meaning. For example, you can write this in, the company lost $20 million worth of business. So isn't that clear? Isn't that precise? Yeah? 
So don't leave out details. Don't use words like substantial, some amount, a large amount, a little amount. Yeah. So in technical writing, it's a no-no, right? Because you come up across as very vague and not clear. All right. So be precise. Another example, this one. The hard disk, disk has lots of memory. What's wrong with this? Uh, how loss of memory should, yes. should be yes yes again take the number yeah you need a number a figure don't don't give you know things like this ah uh. don't 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 use expressions of terms like lots of memory little memory a lot of memory much memory that's not effective writing yeah again very vague so give a number you know lah memory for don't it's normally measured in unit isn't it gigs la, bytes la, whatever. So give a number, then it's very clear. So that if 20 people were to read this statement, they all understand it, uh, same meaning, they all have the same understanding. It has 64 gigs memory, okay? And finally, this one. We will meet the staff as soon as possible. What's wrong with this? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. Ah, what's wrong with as soon as possible? When? They didn't mention the time. Yes, again, very vague, very ambiguous. As soon as possible can mean a million things to a million people. To you, it may mean by tonight, uh, we will meet the staff tomorrow as soon as possible. Somebody else may think that uh, as soon as possible, uh, we will meet the staff next week. It's also as soon as possible. To different people, it means different things. So do not leave room for people to guess right? what they're trying to say here. So give the details. Give the necessary details so that there will be no miscommunication, no misunderstanding. Give a date. Like one way is to, for example, give a date. Or time will be even better. Uh, even though this one before the 15 is still not, not detailed enough, but still better than as soon as possible. Lor. Yeah? Okay, like, for example, in your letter, you don't write, I hope to receive your reply as soon as possible. I hope to hear from you as soon as possible. Okay? To you, it may mean... As soon as possible is uh, tonight to your reader. It may mean next month to him. That is as soon as possible. So can you imagine the amount of problem it will cause uh, when we are vague and not precise? Okay. Okay, you clear on this? Um, let me see. What, okay, so that's precise, huh? All right. I won't go through this. Uh, maybe you can. This is just another practice example here where you can improve on. Making adding adding relevant details, huh? uh, I won't go through this lah. Okay, never mind, like, You you give me the answer as, uh, quickly lah. Give me the answer for this one. I will be home as early as possible. Somebody give me the uh, rewrite this and make it more precise. As early as possible. Ah uh, yeah. So how should it be rewritten as? Just add any detail. I will, I will be, be home before seven p.m. Or seven now before midnight lah, okay, or something like that. Lah. Uh, give uh, what do you call? Yeah, something like that. Give some details. Huh? the basketball player is very tall. Again, be precise. Give the, the basketball player is two meter tall. Is ah huh? two meters or two meters or uh. I will, I will, uh, in inches or meters. Two meters ah, uh, yeah, two meters. And this one, what's wrong with this? Thank you for your letter. Let's say you're replying somebody who has written to you and thank you for your letter. What's wrong with this? Will it confuse the reader? Will it cause confusion? Yeah, the letter. Which letter do, do the... Ah, exactly. You know, in business, uh, uh, people can receive and write hundreds of letters, you know, every day. So which letter are you referring to, right? Which particular letter? So the person will be confused. Thank you for your letter. Which letter? So the best way is to specify, lah, be precise. How, how can he how can you improve here? Thank you for your letter. What? Normally we add huh? a date. Ah, a date. That's right. Date will be the best. Thank you for your letter dated. The person who will use his letter will have a date. Really, right? Thank you for your letter dated, whatever. So it's very clear lah. So the person who, who got this message for you and know which letter he's referring, you are referring to. Okay? And again, this one, we received your order some time ago. 
some time ago, we received your order recently, we received your order just now, all these are very vague and ambiguous. So avoid all this. So we, how do you improve on it? We received your order, give a date. That's the best. Or even your order also, you know, if, it's, if there's an order number, give the order number, right, on such and such a date. So very clear, very precise, straight to the point, not vague, not ambiguous. Okay, and it won't uh, give rise to misunderstanding, miscommunication. Okay, so you're clear on that, ah, precise. So we are done and precise. Now we go to the next one, concise. Concise is giving information in a few words. Okay, let me go through this also. Uh, like I say uh, just now, earlier on, do not, te in technical writing, it's not the time for you to impress your reader uh, with uh, big words that you would like to use or to impress your reader uh, that you know that your power, uh, what the command of the English language is fantastic. Yeah, this is not the time to show off your English uh, command of English. In fact, uh, good write, uh, good English is plain English, right? Good writing is uh, is written in plain, simple language, all right? Because this is where it uh, the reader clearly understands you and will not be confused with what you're trying to say. So. The, the, the way to go about it is be concise in your writing. The style that you should adopt is being concise. Writing, giving your information in few words. It doesn't mean in few words means you just give half the information. Nah? It means give whatever full information you need to give, but using few words as far as you can. So there are several ways. Uh, okay, before that, nah, let's look at this example. Is it concise? Do you have a problem with this? Yes, uh, it's look, it looks very messy. <laughs> messy? <laughs> Why do you say messy? Uh, we can't directly know what, what, what to do uh, by reading this yeah. message. Why? Why is it that you, you feel confused? There's too many information. Too many words, so many. Uh, information yeah. also, yeah. And look at the words that, that the writer used. In order to facilitate an efficient meeting, can you see kind of big, big words that he's trying to say here? Facilitate an efficient meeting and fuel thought processes prior to June 25th. Wow, it's really, uh, it's like, in a way, it's like trying to show off, you know, they're using big words to show his command of the language. And this is what you should be, you should avoid. A no-no. Okay? Because he's not, um, he is uh, being, uh, the, the word for it is uh, long-winded, very wordy. Wordy, wordy, too many big words. It, actually, this whole thing can be written very simply uh, using shorter, simpler words and shorter sentences. In fact, the sentence also is too, so long. Can you see the first sentence? It goes through, how many lines? Uh? Five lines, my goodness. Five lines, you know, first sentence. Too long sentences, too much, too long sentences, too, too big words. So it's very long-winded and wordy. And if you are a reader, you read this, you also get very... How do you feel? Would you want to read, even read to the end? Ah? <laughs> yeah? You get very annoyed, isn't it? Ah? Annoyed. What is he trying to say here? Ah? So this is a no-no. That's why... Um, it is important to be concise in your writing. Do not annoy your reader. Uh, you wouldn't want to annoy your reader or irritate your reader because you want your reader to, to be able to read and um, feel good about reading what you have to say because you will want them to uh, respond positively to you and cooperate with uh, whatever you want them to do uh, for them or with them, isn't it, right? So one way to do this is avoid being long-winded, yeah? So, okay, we quickly look at, so in, to avoid being long-winded, in, in other words, to be concise, there are just two simple ways of doing this. Use simple words and use short sentences. Your words are too simple, your sentences short. Some of you may think, oh, it's very, very easy, but it may not be as easy as you think. Huh? Sometimes it's harder to explain something in few words huh? uh, than to use longer, uh, bigger words and longer sentences. Okay, let's, let's look at the first one first. Use simple words. What do you mean by simple words? This is quite, 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 quite clear. Lah. I mean, quite uh, simple, lah, right? Uh, changing long words to short words. So instead of using long words, 
If there's a shorter word that means the same thing, please like, use the simple word. Plain, common word. Okay? For example, the word utilize. Can I use a simpler word? Use. Yeah, use. Please utilize the, the washroom. Why you utilize? Just say use. Lah. Right? Like I say, it's not the time to show off your English. Yeah? And then also, also remember, when you write technical writings, uh, uh, let's say even memos and letters, uh, you may be writing to people from different countries, other countries, international readers, and people whose first language, uh, it's not like us like that, where English is our first or second language. Yeah? To, to some of these countries, uh, their, their English is not their first second language. So they may not be very familiar with some terms, some of the words that you use. So that's why they say use simple common words that people can quickly see and read and understand. Yeah? Anticipate. What is a better word for that? I anticipate. Hope. Huh? Sorry? Hope. Huh? Hope. Hope. Oh, hope. Hope. hope or actually not so much hope. I anticipate uh, your response, your reply. Ah. Uh, it's more of I well, what what are the examples? Mm, think. Expect. Expect, yeah, it's more expect or, or I wait for your reply, I await your reply, or I expect your reply. Huh? Cooperate. We should cooperate with one another. Work together. Yeah, work together or uh even although we are quite familiar with this word, but but you know, uh if we can find a simpler word. Uh, instead of three syllables, uh, these are all, these are all, you can see they're all multi-syllabic words. Multi-syllabic means more than one syllable. Suku uh. kata, cooperate is three syllable, four syllable. So use a simple, if you can use single uh, syllable is even better, right? Uh, work, work, work together, okay, there's two words. Or help, help each other, cooperate with each other, help each other, help, okay? Indicate. Please show. Show, show yes. Use the word show. Why indicate? Huh? No need to say indicate. Just show. Initially. Initially. What do you mean by initially? Initially, uh, we need to identify ourselves. What is initially? We need firstly. To, firstly, yes. Initial means first one. The first step. Or first lah. Right? First, identify yourself. First, introduce yourself. Huh? In, instead of initially. Presently. Presently, we are having a class. Now? Huh? Now? Yes, now. Now, we are having a class right now. No need presently. Prohibit? Prohibit? Prohibit Don't. someone? Huh? Don't. Huh? Prohibit. You know the meaning of prohibit or not? Prohibit means you, uh, you, uh, you have set up roadblocks. Prohibit people from crossing from one district to another. What's Can prohibit? Not. Avoid, uh, to stop, lah. stop people. Lah. Stop. Prohibit means stop, lah, right? Inconvenience. Inconvenience is quite important. Trouble. Trouble or problem, yeah? Instead of using, or, or troubles, okay, nah? uh, sorry for any inconvenience, sorry for any problems caused, right? Or trouble caused, nah? rather than inconvenience. So as far as, for, as, far as possible, uh, use uh, one or two syllable words, lah, right? Try to avoid three, four syllable words. These are, these are called examples of big words, lah. But of course, there are certain words that cannot be helped, lah, like internet. Internet, three syllable, you have to say internet, lah. There's no other simpler word for that. So most of the time, whenever you can find a short word, simpler, common words, that most people will be able to read straight away and understand, use them, right, instead of the bigger word. Okay? Simple words, lah. Now, we go to short sentences, huh? Uh, short sentences, there are actually four ways to avoid, to, to keep your sentences short. Just to keep in mind, I'll go through this very quickly. Yeah, uh, short sentences, yeah. One way is to avoid unnecessary repetitions. You know, sometimes in English, uh, we tend to use repetitions in our words. You know. For example, uh, uh, what's that? Cooperate together. Cooperate together. It's a repetition, you know. Okay, let's look at one example. Now. Collaborated together. 
what is wrong with this? How can you shorten this sentence by dropping any unnecessary repetitions or redundant words? What is the word that can be dropped here? Hmm? Collaborate. Together. Ah, we collaborated. Drop this one together. Just say we collaborated on the project. Lah. Isn't it? Right? Because collaborate means work together, isn't it? So you don't work together, together. Lah. So we collaborated on the project. All right? So this is what you mean by drop unnecessary repetition. Another one, this is a brand new innovation. How can you make it shorter, the sentence, drop, drop each word? Brand new. Brand new, yes. You can drop the whole thing, brand new. You just say this is... This is... An innovation. Yes, an innovation. Innovation is new, isn't it? Anything that is innovation means it's a new thing. So no need to add this one brand new. Law. So that is what you mean by unnecessary repetition. The other one, the other alternative is to eat soup. The other alternative. Why other alternative? Drop the... Other. Yes, the alternative. Because alternative means other option, right? So don't need so all these these are repetitions, right? So drop by dropping repetitions, you make your sentences shorter, right? Easier to read, direct, and easier to read. Uh okay, again, um, I think we won't go, uh, I, I just go through some of these now, right? For example, uh, another very common look at number four. Let us discuss about the project. What's wrong with this? What is the rep word that can be dropped? Very common. Most of yours write it this way, speak it this way. But there's a redundant word here that doesn't need to be used. About. Let us, huh? About. Let us, let about. Us yes. Let us discuss. Project. Only about. Now, you don't discuss about. You can talk about. Discuss means to talk about. So when you use the word discuss, no need the word about law. So let us discuss the project. Huh? Let us, uh, uh, so this example, you can, the rest you can, some of it is, uh, it's, it's in your homework. So I give you some of these examples. So your homework today will be include exercises on this, how to rewrite sentences to make it shorter. Okay, to make it shorter. So I will so just go through very quickly. Uh, okay. The, the another way to uh, to write short sentences is to avoid the use of too many words. Just now is to avoid repetitions. Now to avoid too many words. Don't use too many words. Ex extra words, making it very wordy, very uh the too many use of too many words is called verbosity. Yeah. So this is an example. The used car will cost the sum of ten thousand ringgit. Okay. What words here, how do you make this sentence shorter? How do you shorten it by dropping some words that are not necessary? Drop the sum of. Yes, yeah, so the used car will cost 10,000. Isn't that, doesn't it mean the same thing? It means the same thing, what? So you don't even need here, it doesn't add to the meaning, it doesn't make it clearer. So these are all extra words that are not needed. So you drop extra words, you shorten the sentence. All right? Another one. In order to successfully accomplish its job functions, the team has been needing more workspace for some time now. Okay, how do we shorten this? This one is also very, again, too many words, that's why it becomes long-winded. What can we drop? Drop successfully. Drop successfully, okay. So how do you rewrite this? In fact, this one. In order, in order, so no need. Drop successfully. The word accomplish is quite a big word. Can you replace it with a simpler word? In order uh, to accomplish. Fulfill. To what? Fulfill. Fulfill. Uh, fulfill also quite a big word. Oh. Simpler, so, so. simpler. For simple words. Success. Achieve. 
achieve. Why you people all like achieve is also quite a big word. Simpler than that. Complete. Complete, okay. Uh, slightly better, yeah. Better than accomplish. Complete. Uh, any any other word simpler than that? One syllable. One syllable. I can think of one word. One syllable. Do. Sorry. Meet. Meet is job functions. Um. Finish. Finish, ah. Finish, complete. Okay, lah. It's more or less the same. Success. Not, not su succeed, ah. No. Just a simple one instead of accomplish. Do. Huh? Do. <laughs> Why do. you have to think so hard, ah? To. To do. To do, exactly. To do is job. Isn't it? Just do, lah. No need accomplish. Even complete also okay, lah. But do is even better, isn't it? Right? So, think simple, lah. Think simple. To do its job, no need functions are job job enough la, to do its job. The team, instead of has been needing, just say the team. The team needs needs what? Needs more workspace la, No need for some time now. Okay, so to do its job, the team needs more workspace. To do its job, the team needs more workspace. Isn't that better? Or you can put it the other way around. The team. Needs more workspace to do its jobs. So isn't that nice and sweet? Short and sweet, concise. Yeah, so that it's not too wordy and long-winded. Huh? Keep it. Keep your sentences short. Right? And another way also of keeping sentences short is where there are long phrases like this. Uh, if you can replace it with one word, use one word. For example, this phrase. At this point in time. At this point in time. Can you replace it in one word? Now. Yes, now. Yeah, in the first place. In the first place. In the first place. We need to buy a textbook. In the first place. Firstly. Replace, firstly. Firstly, or just first. Now, first, we need to get a textbook. Due to the fact that. Because. Because. That, Students like to write. Uh, I was absent due to the fact that I was sick. Just because, lah. Because, nah. Take into consideration. One word. I hope you will take this into consideration. I hope you will. Just the word. Consider. The with the exception of. Except. 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 Yes, he was. We were all there with the, John. No need with the exception of John. With regard to? Regarding. Regarding in the near future. <laughs> in the future. In the future. Mm, one word, one word. In the near future. Soon. Soon, yes. Or in the near future, no need. Yeah? So it's wherever you can use one word to replace phrases like this. Huh? That's how to keep to be concise in the style, okay? All right, uh, I won't do this also. Uh, we have to. So anyway, just uh, in your homework, like they, they, uh, you will have exercises on this. But um, uh, what do you call it? Uh? Uh, it will be a little bit more difficult. Like this, more simple, straightforward. So we have to rush through a bit. Let me. Uh, I'm, you're still on concise. Uh? Another method of keeping a sentence short. This is the third method. Is do not talk around the point. In other words, avoid. Not avoid what you call double negative. This is an example of double negative. Can you can you see this? This gemstone is not uncommon. Can you see two negative that is not uncommon? What is the writer trying to say? Yeah? Uh, is this gem common or not common? Common. Yes. <laughs> what he means is this gemstone is common. So drop, do not say things with two negative double negative. Basically, what he means is this gemstone is common. So say this way instead of this way. Especially British, uh, the, the British, they like to say things like this, you know. Very, um, very, very, what do you call it? Sometimes their writing is very difficult to read. So go for the American style is, is the best. Straightforward and direct. Yeah, concise. Huh? Okay. Uh, all right, another example. It is not without interest that most of the products are produced. It is not without interest. It is 
not without interest. Is it with interest or without interest? Is it interesting or not interesting? So you can see the double negative. Not and without. So how do you rewrite that? It is It is what? It is interesting. Ah, it is interesting that most of the products were from the same manufacturer. Okay? It means the same thing. But don't, don't say it this way. It's not beating around the bush. It's not clear. Not direct. Lah. Not direct. Very indirect way of saying. Okay? So keep it this way. Make it direct. Okay? Drop the double negative. Okay? And finally, the... Uh, okay, we'll, this one also will... Okay, the fourth way is avoid the passive voice. Huh? Uh, to keep sentences short, use active voice rather than the passive voice. I hope you, you know what is passive and active. Huh? Passive is where it's not direct. Again, it's not direct. Active is a direct where the doer is in front. For example, this one, it is my decision to run for office. Try to avoid writing starting sentences with it is, there are, right? Straight away, uh, this is written in the passive form. Write it, change it to active form where you put the doer in front. How do you improve this? How do you make this into an active voice? I decide to run for office. Yes, very good. Uh, so instead of it is my decision, so I decided to run for office. The doer is in front, the subject is in front, and it is direct, right? Straightforward. Another one? There are, there are 16 people who try out for the basketball team. Again, passive voice. Shorten it to active voice. How do you say? 16 people try out for the basketball mm -hmm. team. Exactly. All this and uh, unnecessary. There are, la, who, la, not necessary. Just 16 people try out. Right? Rather than using the passive voice, use the active voice as far as possible. And this one, of course, is very simple. The computer was purchased by Tom. Tom purchased the computer. Yes, Tom purchased the computer. Used active voice. You notice the active voice, huh? sentences are shorter, much shorter. Yeah? Use less words, fewer words. That's how to be, to keep it concise. Okay. Uh, okay, I won't go through this. Okay, maybe we can do a, a, a short example. Uh, practice on this. Huh? Uh, rewrite the long, following long sentences to make them shorter. I will be calling you on October 31st to see if you have any questions at that time. Okay? How do you shorten this sentence? Anybody give a try? Words like, um, I will be calling. Just say, I will call you on. You, yes, on. Uh, this one has to be enough, right? Because it's being precise, isn't it? The details to be there. I will call you on October 31st to, is that, to see if you have any questions at that time. Uh, this is very too many words here. Anybody, how do you shorten that to? I will call you on October 31st to answer your questions. Yes. Yes, to answer your question, to answer question. I will call. In fact, no need even you. Because I'm speaking to you, so it's understood. I will call on October 31st to answer questions. Yes, good. Okay, now try the next one. Again, uh, very well. By the way, uh, for your information, uh, the style of writing and afterwards the tone, uh, it will be in your homework. And this is the uh, will be tested in your first test that you are having uh, uh, in week 8. So make sure you get plenty of practice uh, doing this, how to be concise and precise in writing. Okay, let's try this. If You see how, how long-winded it is. If I can be of any assistance to you, in the evaluation of this proposal, please feel free to give me a call. Too many words, not necessary. What can you drop? How can you rewrite it? 
feel free I can help you in Sorry? the evalu if I can help you in the evaluation of this proposal, please call me. Please call me. Okay, right. Good, good try. You can shorten it further. If I can uh, just not instead of saying just good, instead of saying if of any assistance, if I can be of any assistance to you, no need, if I can help you. Right? This one evaluating in, this proposal. Ah, in evaluating this proposal, no need in the evaluation of again. This is a passive voice, right? So in evaluating this proposal, comma, please. Call me. Call me, yes, please. Please call me. Uh, or just please call. Uh. Instead, of, don't you say feel free to give me a call? No need. I'll just go direct. Please call. Okay. So, yeah. If I can help you evaluate this proposal, so I'm only in evaluating some more, we can shorten some more. If I can help you evaluate this proposal, can you see? So direct, so clean, isn't it? Right? Easy to read. Easy to understand. Direct, straightforward rather than this. Now you understand what you mean by concise, right? Isn't it better like this? Right? For the reader especially. Yes. Clean and trim and uh, very nice. Uh, right? Easy to understand. Yeah? If I can help you evaluate this proposal, please call. Habis cerita. Everything is clear and it's understood. No need to go round and round using extra words. This is what you mean, like extra words for what? Right? Uh, it will also imagine uh, um, if you're writing a letter or memo full of extra words like that. So it's not effective, like, right? Remember, you're, you want to acquire the skill of being an effective technical writer. Concise. So this is an example of concise. Very good. Okay, try the next one. I am of the opinion. Uh, now you see, uh, sometimes um, uh, people use extra words to make want to sound more formal, very formal, to sound very uh, what do you call it? Uh, like so highly professional. Actually, it doesn't. You know, it defeats the purpose because uh, in the first place, um, the modern way is we don't use this style anymore. We use extra words to sound more formal. That's the old way. Huh? The modern way is direct, straightforward, simple. That's actually the American style. We follow the American style. It's better than the British style in that sense. Huh? And more and more people are using that straightforward, direct, right? Uh, simple word, short sentences. Yeah? So let's come to this now. I am of the opinion that Lazard employees have too much work to do. Uh, this one is too conversational, right? Uh, again, too many words. You can drop and make it slim and trim. How do you make this sentence slim and trim and neat and concise? Anybody? I think that mm. Lazar, yeah, Lazar yes. employees have too much work. Have too much work. Okay, right. Uh, good try. Uh, you notice, uh, you don't use the uh, drop this one. I am of the opinion. No need. It sounds sound very bombastic. Sound very. You sound very proud, lah. Sound very proud. Sound very arrogant. Just say, I think, lah. Huh? Or I feel. I think. No need. I am of the opinion. Yes, that's good. I think that. Or even no that also can. I think Lazard employees have too much work to do. Can you? Can this phrase be shortened? Use another term. I think Lazard employees, you can try. Are uh, busy. Are uh, busy. Okay. Are uh, busy. Are uh, busy uh, has a slight different meaning of uh, from have too much work to do, you know. Slightly different. Have too much work to do. Are uh, busy, it can be like, it's not an, a bad thing, busy. Like busy because business is good and all those things, but this one have too much work to do. Uh, it's more like um, um, like uh, what do you call it? Uh, like a problem that they are facing. Right? It's it's not just being busy. Any other uh, try? Good try. Any other? Instead of have too much to do. 
Anybody has any uh, suggestion? I think Lazard employees. Anybody? Are too, are too busy. Are too busy. Busy again. Are too busy. Oh, all right. Um, in fact, try to drop the word too. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you have too much work to do, uh, what is the one word that is one term that is not to use? Too stress. Ah, ah, ah. Too stress. Yes, <laughs> over stress. Okay. Ah, uh, over. Over. Yeah, correct. Overwork. Yes. So it's 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 talking about a problem that they are facing. So they are overworked. We are not saying that they are too busy. Yeah, busy is not like a problem, but are overworked. Yes, it's a problem that they are facing. Yeah. Okay. Good. I think Lazard employees are overworked. See? Again, so much better, clearer, straightforward, direct, right? Not beating around the bush. Okay, that is what you mean by being concise. Okay, finally, I'm sure you can do this one for me. In the month of December, my family will make a visit to the state of Penang. Concise, concise. In December. Hmm. My family will visit Penang. Very good. Exactly. That's it. In December, my family will visit Penang. No need the month off, la, make a visit, la, the state off, la, all these job to drop. These are called extra words. All right. So you, 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 you get the idea, yeah? Uh, keep your sentences short and sweet. So they clear, easy to understand, easy to follow by your readers. All right, very good. Now we go to the last one, characteristic of technical writing uh, is tone. Just now we talk about style. Huh? Style is about the words used, uh, word usage, the, 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 the simple words, short sentences, uh, being uh, having details, clear with your details, okay? That is style. Now, tone is something slightly different. It's also on in uh, regarding the way you write. It's both style and tone uh, refer to the style or uh, the way you write the, the words that you use, right, uh, in writing your document. So, but tone uh, is a little bit more abstract in the sense that, you know, the words that you use uh, can convey a certain kind of emotion or feeling one, you know. Even though it's technical writing, even though you're not writing about something uh, creative or what, uh, even in technical writing, you can, in the words that you write, in the way you write, convey a certain feeling or emotion, right, uh, to your reader. And um, you certainly, uh, for example, uh, uh, words like you, you, okay, let me give you an example. Uh, in your writing, you can sound courteous or demanding. You can sound formal or informal. Uh, in fact, you can sound positive or negative. You can convey this kind of feelings to your reader. So definitely in writing technical document, uh, you would want to convey a feeling that is or emotions that are positive, that is courteous, isn't it, right? Rather than rude, uh, that is um, uh, to a certain extent, caring emotion, a caring feeling, right? And of course, at the same time, uh, a professional uh, impression, business-like, right, in your writing rather than uh, over casual and so on. So these are, talk these, are the, these are the examples of tones that you can convey in your writing. So let me put it down here, something like this. Your, your, your tone can be formal or informal, subjective or objective. Now, you always try to be objective in your writing. Objective in your technical writing. Objective means uh, being, uh, what do you call it? Unbiased. Don't be biased. You know, you know, in your writing, you can show, you can convey uh, uh, whether you're biased or prejudiced, you know, towards a certain thing, towards a certain person, right? So do not, do not convey that kind of tone of biasness or prejudice. In other words, be objective, right? Uh, in your writing, it can be emotional and informative. Now, in technical writing, you, you would want to be informative rather than emotional in your writing. Okay? Avoid being emotional. Even if you are 
are writing about a complaint or you are replying to a complaint, do not be emotional, be objective, at the same time be informative. Uh, you can be courteous or demanding, right? Or condescending. Condescending means uh, looking down. You know, you can write in such a way that when your reader reads or feels that you are looking down on him or her, uh, you wouldn't want your reader to feel that way because it will, your reader will feel offended. Yeah, you wouldn't want to offend your reader, lah, right? Correct or not? You wouldn't want your reader to be offended or to feel angry with you because you would want your reader to, uh, whatever you, you who, whoever you want to write to, you want your reader to be uh, acceptable to want to cooperate with you, isn't it? And do what you want them to do. So all the all the uh, so all the while, keep your tone right, right? Courteous, formal or informal. Uh, usually formal, but sometimes if you write, it depends on who you write to. Like if you write to your peers, you can be a little informal. But you write to your boss, you tend to be more formal. Be objective rather than subjective. Be informative. Be courteous, right? Warm and personal, right? So these are different tone that you will you can convey in your writing. So be careful to make sure that the you convey the right tone, and because the right tone will give a positive impression to your reader. You will always want to give a positive impression, isn't it? The right impression to your reader, right? And not to give a wrong impression, not to give a negative impression, not to. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Because it will be a bad, uh, what do you call it? It will cause some, um, it will result in giving your company a bad image or yourself a bad image. And especially if you are writing, representing your company, when you're writing to your clients or customers, you'll give a bad image. So you wouldn't want to have to, to cause that in your writing. So make sure your tone is right. Yeah. So tone is a little bit more challenging to achieve. Eh? A style is a little bit easier right to, to to handle but tone a little bit more difficult but you you, you will get it through practice right? you'll be able to get it to acquire it through constant practice and reading like read how people write okay for example like, this is another, uh, another example this one example like, uh, a tone uh. Uh, what do you think of this tone uh, if you are the user you need to enter your username and password to log in in the first place too many words like. Yeah, what do you think of this? Is it professional sounding? Or is it casual? What do you think? Wondering. Huh? Wondering. Wondering. Oh, sorry? If I'm not the user. Oh, if I'm not the user. Okay. Uh, all right, you can look at that one way. Let's say if you are the user. Uh, anyway, is, uh, right, you, one point you brought out is, uh, there's actually no need to mention uh, if you are the user, uh, right? Because if you want to log in, you are definitely are the user. Uh. So you can drop phrases like this. No? Okay. Uh, would you think that it is a little bit, um, uh, you can make it a little bit more professional sounding. It doesn't sound professional, doesn't it? It sounds very, uh, it's a conversation you're having with a friend. If you are the user, you need to enter your username and password to log in. It's not, it's too too casual, too conversational. So it's not too, not, not business-like, too informal in that sense. Lah. Okay, how do you correct the tone and make it more professional sounding, more formal and use less, fewer words? Lah. In fact, you can drop all these pronouns, actually. Anybody wants to try? What is the message here, actually? Just go straight to the message. No need if you are this or if you are that. What does is, what is the message say, actually? Want the reader to do? Very easy. Or... Please enter your username and password ah, to log in. Yeah, please enter your username and password to log in. Okay, in fact, don't even have to use your, please enter uh, username and log, password, or to, log, or to log in, enter username and password, okay? So it's, it's a little bit more professional and business-like rather than this, lah. okay? So more formal, more business-like. To log in, enter username and password. Huh? Sometimes it's, uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, it's too conversational, too informal, also it's not impressive lah, right, to the reader, right? Okay, another example. Hmm. Let's look at this few. Lah, huh? What do you think of this? I don't allow anyone to come late. Let's say your boss writes this to you. How do you feel? What kind of tone is this? Is it a nice tone? 
Let me see. It sounds a bit rude. Ah, it sounds a bit rude. Yeah, in fact, it sounds very rude. Lah. It's like you're looking down on the person you're writing to. Now, just because you are the boss and the person is your staff, it doesn't uh, mean that you can be, uh, you you need to, I sound very bossy, right? You don't need to talk down to a person. Okay, it's very negative using words like, negative words like don't, right? Don't allow anyone to come late, right? Negative, very negative, very bossy. And it doesn't give a right tone and person, people who receive it won't feel very nice, isn't it? Would you want to cooperate with your boss? Uh, in this case, would most people want to cooperate if you get a message like this from your boss? Most people will probably not, love, right? So very negative. Okay, how can you improve it and give it a positive tone? Anyone? Make it, turn, it, turn it around and make it positive by saying the same thing, you know, but avoid using negative words like late, don't. I expect everyone to come early. Okay, I expect everyone to come early. Okay, good try. So instead of saying don't come late, you ask them to come early. Okay, good. Uh, but the word I expect, uh, maybe you can... Uh, have another word to make it sound more positive. Expect also a little bit bossy, I think. Anybody else? Or I can just say, please come early. I hope everyone can come early. Uh, okay, I hope everyone can come early, can, right? All right, so that's how it goes. Like, or I encourage everyone to come early. Or I encourage punctuality. Or please be punctual. Or please come early. Can you see that? All right? So this is what you mean by positive tone. All right. Very nice. Saying the same thing. But you would want to convey a right, appropriate uh, impression on your reader. Because you would want your reader to cooperate with you. Isn't it? So when you receive this from your boss, you would you would definitely, most likely, everyone would want to cooperate. Lah. Yeah, you have no problem with this kind of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, with this kind of ruling that your boss gives you, right? Because he says it in a positive tone, okay? All right, another one. If you are buying, sign up with the agent. If you are buying, sign up with the agent. So imagine if this statement uh, appears in a leaflet or flyer, right? Uh, selling something. If you are buying, sign up with the agent. It sounds very... How does it sound to you? What kind of tone is this? What does it make you think of the company? And the person writes this. Very not professional, isn't it? Right? Uh, too informal. Lah. Sign up. Instead of sign up, can you come up with a more uh, formal business-like uh, expression? Sign up with the agent. What is the word that you can use? Sign up, sign up. Usually when we talk, we say sign up, ah, sign up. Ah. But when you write, you have to sound, come across, especially in something that is dealing with clients and customers, a little bit more formal, a little bit more business-like more professional. How? Anybody? Too casual. This is too casual. Instead of sign up, what is one word you can use? Approach. Approach. Uh, approach is... Approach is just... For instance, sign up. Contact. Contact. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Contact, okay lah. But uh, you can also use the word uh, register lah. Register with the agent, okay? Prospective buyers must register with the agent. All right? Okay, uh, finally, there are many things that make this happen. Uh, this one, what's that using? There are many things. Uh, this one, okay, many things. Too informal lah, right? In your writing, especially, like I say, speaking is okay. But when you are writing, uh, um, it has to sound more formal and more professional, right, in your words. Because it reflects on your, on you, it reflects on your company. So there are many things that make this happen. You know, like, like we are talking like that, you know. But when you're writing, you have to be a little bit more formal. How can we improve this? 
instead of saying there are many things, what other words can you use? More formal. It's too informal. Too informal. How to make it more formal? Many? Anybody? Hey, why always the same few people? Who are the others? Ah? Hmm. I have, have to call out names. Ah. I don't know whether you people are all here. Are you all here? Everybody? I know it's been some time already. I will finish this. I'll give you a short break. Right? But you all have to respond. Lah. Anybody else? There are many things. Anybody? There are many? The courses. Courses, okay, good. Or oh, many factors, huh? There are many factors, many courses, okay. Uh, make this happen, you say that cause this, law. Okay, many factors, so it's more formal, lah. Okay. All right, uh, one more exercise, huh? Can you try to rewrite this uh, to make the tone more positive, more positive? Like I say, all this comes with practice. Yeah, it comes with practice, uh, especially regarding tone, huh? Regarding tone. Uh, so the more you practice, the more you read, uh, you learn to pick it up, how to make your tone right. For example, look at this. Your order has not been shipped because we do not have the item you ordered in stock. How does it sound? Imagine you order something from a, from a shop and this is the reply that you got from them. Your order has not been shipped because we do not have the item you ordered in stock. How does it sound? What's the tone here like? Quite rude, isn't it? Yeah? Try to drop negative words like not. We do not. Huh? Try to refrain from using negative words like this. Okay, how can you rewrite this? Anyone? Turn it around, make it more positive. Hmm? Your order will be shipped mm. once we have the item in the stock. Yes, your order will be shipped once we have, or as soon as we have the item you ordered in stock. Right, right. right? So that is positive, right? And, uh, and 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 avoid using negative words like this, lah. Or uh, yeah, good. Or you can uh, make it sound a little bit more, uh, what do you call it, personal. You can say, we will ship your order as soon as we have the item in stock. Okay, good. The next one, we cannot accept the report because you did not submit the reference page. We cannot accept the report because you did not. So again, the order, the cannot la, did not la, drop all these words. Make it positive. Anyone? Yeah, all these people. Only if mm. submitted the reference page. Anybody? Can I call some names? I think these people are whether I know it's already near dinner time, but you still have to be here. The three hour class. Anybody? We uh, will accept the report after you submit the reference page. Yes, we will. Accept, yes, don't say we cannot. Say we will, we will accept. But it must be after or as soon as you. It's almost the same as this one, right? As soon as you submit the reference page. See? That doesn't, doesn't that sound much better, right? We will accept the report as soon as you submit the reference page. So it means the same thing, right? But it's more positive rather than this way, okay? Another one. I will not speak at your conference because my schedule is too packed. Again, I will not speak at your conference. So try to drop the word not, avoid using this. And how do you rephrase this? It doesn't mean to make it stiff means you agree to speak at your conference. I right? doesn't mean change, I will not speak, I will speak. I mean that, it means that you still say the same message, but with the positive. Let's try to change some of the words that you use. Anybody? I will speak at your conference when I am free. When I'm free. Okay. Good try. Except that if you say I will speak at your conference when I am free, the conference host may be waiting 
and hoping that uh, when you are free, then you will come and speak. But actually, the message you're trying to say is you will not speak at this particular conference, you know, because your schedule is already too packed. Here, if you say when I'm free, you're giving him the hope, hoping that, oh, when you are free, when your schedule is not so packed, then you will come and speak. Uh, try again. I will speak at your conference, but my schedule is too packed. Yeah. Okay, but my schedule is too packed. Okay, I will speak at your conference, but my schedule is too packed. All right. Yeah, post can. Uh, yeah, this it will be a little bit clearer because it, it gives the message to the conference host that you will definitely not speak because your schedule is too packed. All right. I will speak, but my schedule is too packed. All right, uh, let's see. Yeah. Or you can say, I would speak if my schedule has not been so packed. Yeah, that's another way of saying it. All right, finally, I cannot accept the recommendation. I cannot accept the recommendation. Instead of saying, can, instead of saying cannot accept, because it's a bit, again, it is negative, uh, try to avoid saying the word, I cannot accept. Cannot. But it doesn't mean uh, to make it positive means you say, okay, now I can accept. Huh? No, your message is still, I cannot accept. But use a positive tone. How can you rephrase it? I, what? Any other way of saying this? I will consider. <laughs> Again, I will consider, uh, it's very kind. But uh, you're giving the person hope. You're not supposed to give him hope because you are definitely not accepting the recommendations. Okay. So you do not say, I will consider. Try again. I'm unable to accept. Uh, I'm unable to accept the recommendation. Unable is also the same as. So it comes to yes, so, huh? But still, it is still negative. It still has a negative tone. Anybody else? I have to reject the recommendation. I have? To reject. Cannot hear what is that? I have? To reject. Sorry, I? I have to reject the recommendation. Oh, I have to reject. Oh, I have to reject your recommendation. Oh, you're also very strong word. La. Reject is also a very strong negative word. Imagine if you receive, put yourself in the reader's shoe. Imagine if you receive it, are you reject? You know, it's very strong word, isn't it? Very discouraging, though. No? I will reconsider. <laughs> again, again, you're giving the person hope. I will reconsider. Uh, no, because you are not going to reconsider. Your final answer is you cannot accept the recommendation. So, again, try again. You have to say the, 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 the exact message, but in the positive. Okay, I'll give you I, I have to decline the recommendation. I have to decline. I have to decline. I have to reject. I cannot accept. It means the same thing. It is still negative, right? Maybe this one. I wish I could accept the recommendation. Does it say the same thing? Does it give a yeah. Does that make you feel better when you receive this kind of uh, answer? I wish I could accept. But then you understand that you are not accepting. Huh? But you say it in a very positive I wish I could, but I can't. Um, probably you can give reasons. Lah, right? So it's better than just saying outright, I reject or I cannot accept. Okay? Or I have to decline. Right? And, and, and definitely don't say I will reconsider or what because you are not reconsidering. Okay? So this is one way of saying like, I wish I could accept the recommendation. Very positive. Like, very encouraging. Although you are rejecting his recommendation. Okay? All right. So that's it. Um, right. So let's recap what we have done today. This is what we have covered. Um, we looked at technical uh, writing. Basically, technical writing uh, is technical information conveyed in writing at the workplace. It also means technical writing, basically, in other words, we sometimes use the word business writing or uh, business writing or professional writing, business writing at the workplace, right? So technical writing, that's what we are uh, looking at here. It's more of business writing at the workplace. Right? 
in conveying information at the, through writing at the workplace. Okay, and then we looked at um, uh, how uh, in a technical document, the message must have a specific subject written to specific audience and for a specific purpose. Huh? So as a writer, you must be aware of this. Huh? What is your subject? Who is your audience? And why is the reason? What is the reason you're writing it? It must be specific. So you, before you even start writing your message. And then we look at characteristics, right? So we covered characteristics. What are the six characteristics of technical writing that we looked at today? Number one? Subject. Yeah, the subject, right? Subject must be accurate. This fact. Then we look at the audience. Aud audience must be specific. Audience. Yeah, you must know who your audience are, right? Because different audience will require different techniques, isn't it? Right? We looked at that also. Huh? And then your third characteristic? Organization. Yes, organization okay. must be direct, it must be clear, right? And uh, 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 using different uh, special features, right? Remember, technical documents have special features such as, right, all these uh, headings, subheadings, all these to make your writing clear, your presentation clear and easy to understand, quick to read and understand, right? And what else? What are the other characteristics? Two more. Your style. Yes, yeah, style. Very important. Huh? More, uh, uh, of course, all these are important, equally important huh, when you do technical writing. Keep all this in mind. Huh? But style is on, especially the language you use, how you write. Very important, your style of writing must be two keywords here, precise and concise. Yeah. And finally, your tone. Huh? Tone. Tone. Your tone must be positive. Tone means the emotions are the feelings you convey to your to your reader. Must be always be positive, always be objective, business like, right? Formal. It depends. Sometimes it can be a little informal if you are writing to your peers. Okay, so that's about that's it, lah. We have covered uh, technical writing. Uh, generally, what it, what it involves, what it involves, huh, When you do technical writing. Okay, any questions? Any question? Any questions? We are not done yet, nah? we still have another hour to go. So what I want you to do now, okay, we have a short break, right? Give you about five, five minute break. Let's take a break and then we go, I will, I will stop, uh, we will go back to the, we will go back, we will go to the chat room. Okay, you go to the chat room. Uh, oh yeah, before that, wait, let me finish show with this one. Uh, Go to your spectrum, right? There are handouts for this week's lesson. Three handouts. Please download it from Spectrum under week two. You have this one, technical writing slide cast. This is done by Dr. Yo. It covers, it actually is a summary of what we covered just now huh? in, 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 in today's lesson. But it's a summary. It's just a 30-minute slide cast. So please download it and listen to it, okay? We summarize the important things that we have covered right in today's lesson. Huh? It's a very good summary and help you to go over so that you can remember what is covered today. Yeah? Secondly, this is a document, uh, PDF document. Download this, the characteristics of technical writing. There are two. Huh? And this second one is more on, this is general. The second one is covering style. What are the, how to achieve the different style of writing, how to be precise and concise. These are his notes. Huh? Yeah, the handout notes. So please download this. Go to Spectrum, download this, right, for this week's lesson. Uh, do it as soon as possible. Uh, don't delay. Uh, huh? don't, don't, don't procrastinate. Uh, next week is next week already. You have some other set of handouts and homework and so on. Okay? So you have handout from Spectrum. Also, uh, from, from Spectrum, you have your homework. So there will be three exercises Right, exercise one on style and tone, what we covered just now. Those are the few practices that we did just now. So there's one exercise here, I think there are about 16 questions, right? Rewriting in, in the correct style and tone. Exercise two is also on tone. And one more exercise where you have a worksheet where you compare three sample documents and you fill up the worksheet on the different kinds of uh, writing. You have one example is a technical document, another example is an essay, and a third example, I think, an academic writing. So compare the three documents and fill up the worksheet. Can you do that? Okay?
download this and do your homework. You don't have to send it to me this time. We will discuss the answers in the class next week. But you must be give the answer. You must be prepared with your answers. All right? Okay? All right? So what we do now is, okay, you go for a short break. Meanwhile, you can, while you wait for the others, you can have a look at all this, go to your spectrum. And if there are any questions, you can post it in the chat room after this. All right? Okay, let me end this. Okay, uh, all right. We go to our, our, you take a short break and you come back to the chat room. Huh? Yeah, any questions? Okay, I'm going to leave now. We go to the chat room after this. <laughs> 